125 in Australia to 50 below in Russia. We have definitely tipped the point, and we've definitely just begun to experience that tipping point. Um, the White House just released its climate change study. They released it on Friday when you don't want a study to be seen by anybody. In that study, and you can, you can also access that online if you want to fill out that, I'll send that to you. Um, it shows a rise in temperature of 9 to 15 degrees in, on this continent in the next, I don't know what the time frame is, it's kind of irrelevant. If we don't take this into hand, then we probably won't make it as a race. Climate change has really been responsible for really the major evolutionary jumps in the human species. It's when that happens. Our evolutionary jump, if it takes place, is going to be a jump into working with the natural systems, regenerating them, honoring them, and that whole, that whole set of things that you can read about in these articles. It will be in... Um, Reclaiming our intelligence, our language, and our democracy. So it's a, it's a little bit of a challenge to our elected officials who are here today because if we're going to deal with climate change, we really have to have a democratic process in place that honors what's going on with the planet. Right now, that isn't in place, as far as I know, in any political system within the United States. It may be in the state of Vermont. They're always leading stuff. The solutions to climate change in New Mexico are tremendously valuable solutions. The restoration of ranch land, the restoration of farmland, the restoration of watersheds, new energy systems, both thermal and electric, are tremendously valuable right now as an economic boost, as a community boost, etc. All we have to do is I think it's a marriage of, I think it's good to leave religion out of politics, very good, because religion doesn't always get it right, neither does politics. But I think we have to marry something like a sense of sacred for our planet with politics now. If we don't, Mother Earth's going to take care of us anyway. And um, we can't really argue with Gaia when Gaia starts to tip, but we can work with Gaia to regenerate. If a landmass just the size of Australia, which is ironic to talk about since it's on fire right now, if a landmass that size were healthy, had healthy soil, healthy rangelands and forests, it would absorb all the carbon that needs to be absorbed to put us back into balance. That's how powerful the regenerative systems are. With that, I'm going to introduce the newly, newly elected representative, Carl Trujillo, and veteran Senator Peter Wirth. And I would like to honor them as people who have really put out there to become representatives and I think have the true spirit of what that means as elected representatives. So I'd like to give them a round of applause. Thank you, David. My name is Carl Trujillo. I represent District 46. Uh, this is, it actually starts here at the rail yard on the eastern side here. And in Cerritos Road is the boundary and it moves all the way up to Siler Road. And then it takes up north. So it goes through, it's West Alameda, Casa Solana, Agua Fria, and then goes to La Tierra, Aldea, Las Campanas, and then all the way north to the Santa Fe County border. So it has the small communities of Tezuque, uh, Rio en Medio, Chupadero, uh, Tezuque Pueblo, and then the whole Poaque Valley, which is San Ponzo Pueblo, all the way to Nambe Pueblo. And then it goes even further north, which is La Puebla, Arroyo Seco, Chimayo, Rio, uh, Rio Chiquito, Cundio. Uh, I, I want to make sure I don't forget anybody in there, Corteles and Potrero, and San, Santa Cruz, where one of the old churches is over there. And so I'm truly honored to have been elected and represent the people of District 46 in the state of New Mexico. And so I, what I'll do right now is I'll just 
I just explained my district and who I am. I'll, I'll hand it over to Peter Worth, and then I'll take it back, let him introduce himself. And I'm going to go ahead and give you some of the memorials and some of the issues that I'm working on this session. A lot of them have to deal with, with water. And I know it's, a, it's something that's a big crisis in this state, well, basically all over the world as well. But I want to get let you know what I'm getting done and give you maybe a few of the other legislative uh, issues that I'm working on as well. And then maybe Senator Peter Worth will do the same. Thank you, Carl. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Peter. Uh, so I'm not, not the new guy anymore, uh, but it's, it's always good to be here and kind of talk a little bit about the process, what we're going into, some of the bills coming up, and then really I think that the most important thing is to really hear from all of you. Uh, let me just start. Uh, my wife Carol is here. She just came, and this is a, uh, you know, this is a really team effort. It's a family effort. Serving in the legislature, as Carl is finding out, I always call it my uh, full-time, part-time job uh, because it is something that if you take it seriously, which I'm, I'm really thrilled to see the new representatives and senators coming in because I think they are going to be terrific in terms of continuing what we've tried to do up in this district. Uh, Representative Egoff and I, for the last four years, have made a huge effort of doing town halls, reaching out, kind of hearing from all of you. And I will just tell you that's been a key piece to um, our ability to do this job. It's really how the democratic process should work, and I'm, I'm very happy to be part of that. So just a little bit about uh, me. Uh, this is my, this will be my ninth year in the legislature. It's hard to believe. It seems like just yesterday I was sitting right where Carl is. Uh, I've served two terms in the state house, in House District 47 and the last four years in State Senate District 25. We did go through a big redistricting process uh, this last time around, first time I'd been through that. Uh, we may have some questions on that process and the need to reform that whole thing. Uh, but as a result, I've got six new precincts in Senate District 25. So interestingly, uh, Carl and I share a string of precincts I have Dasuki Pueblo is now part of Senate District 25, Chupadero, Rio Medio, uh, Las Campanas, uh, Lamy, Glorieta. So I go all, all the way from kind of the, almost the entrance to the Pecos Village, all the way north. So people typically don't think about the more rural areas in Senate District 25. So uh, I actually am very much looking forward to having new constituents in and continuing to represent the constituents that I've had in the past. Uh, just really quick, I uh, followed, again, one of the, the legends in the legislature, Max Call, who uh, served for 32 years and uh, is a friend, is a mentor to me to this day, uh, someone who cares deeply about New Mexico and our system and did so when he was, was in office. Uh, the fun thing was that he, uh, he started in Roswell as probably the most conservative uh, or one of the most conservative members of the legislature, a Republican, uh, could not have had a tighter crew cut. And uh, he served there for eight years, four terms in the House from Roswell. Uh, left, went to law school, uh, moved up to Santa Fe, uh, ran for the legislature as a Republican in Santa Fe. Uh, slowly but surely, the hair started to grow a little bit, and the beard kind of came in, uh, a couple of earrings, uh, and uh, it was really fun. It's a fun story to tell. Uh, the legislature was tied uh, in the late 80s. It's 35 35, and Max was still a Republican, but was approached by the Speaker, Raymond Sanchez, uh, who said, You know, if you're willing to switch parties, uh, we'll make you chair of the House Appropriations and Finance Committee, and we'll assure that you will not have a Democratic Party opponent uh, while you continue to serve. And Max did make that change. Uh, I, you know, I don't necessarily think, and this is an important point, it didn't necessarily change who he was because of the party that he was representing. Uh, he was someone who believed in the fiscal responsibility, believed in the environment, a kind of socially liberal, conservative on the, on the fiscal issues, uh, a combination that's not per se a bad thing at all. And so uh, 
he did. He served the term out, and I always laugh because my uh, now 96-year-old great aunt, who's a lifelong Republican in Santa Fe, has never forgiven Max for that switch. Uh, but she puts up with me, and I appreciate that. Hope she votes for me. You never know. Uh, so I just so again, one of the things Max did for me in the House is he encouraged me to to be on the House Appropriations and Finance Committee. And so uh, for the four years I was in the House, I got to learn how the budget works. And I'm very hopeful that Carl can kind of figure out a way to continue that Santa Fe uh, tradition of having real input on that committee. Uh, so those, of course, were years when we had more money than the state had to this day ever seen. Uh, and we were able to fund a lot of very important things and kind of catch up in many, many areas. But it was a great time for me to learn uh, the budget and not be just tracked into the, as a lawyer that puts you on the Judiciary Committee, generally right out of the gate. I also served on the uh, Energy and Natural Resources Committee, also kind of a Santa Fe tradition. Uh, Jamie Cook, when he was the state representative, was the chair of that committee and also served on Appropriations and Finance. And now, of course, Brian Egoff has gone on to be the chair of that committee. So these are, these are really important Santa Fe seats, kind of, and I'm hopeful that some of our members coming in uh, both Carl and, and Stephen Easley, who's a terrific state representative from El Dorado, uh, can follow in those footsteps. In the Senate, I've, I've been, um, I tried to get on the Senate Finance Committee, but it's a, it's a much more seniority-based uh, body. So that didn't happen, uh, which in hindsight may have been a, kind of a blessing in disguise because all the money went away. <laughs> and so really for four years now, we have been uh, going through a an unbelievable process of trying to uh, and successfully doing uh, balancing our budget with uh, taking $700 million out of a $6 billion budget. So it, it was really ugly there. At a, at, we were down to 2% reserves and pulling money from every possible place we could find it. Uh, but we managed to make it through without huge uh, layoffs at the state level. And now we're kind of coming out of it. There is some new money, which is good news. Uh, so I serve on the Rules Committee, which does all the confirmations and the constitutional amendments and the election bills, uh, which are very important to me. I'm carrying some this session. We'll talk about those in a minute. Um, and then finally, I'm Vice Chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee. So that's a little bit about uh, kind of who I am, how I got here. And Carl, why don't you talk about what you're going to do? Thanks, Peter. As Peter mentioned, I've been lobbying our soon-to-be speaker, I believe, to be on appropriation and finance as one of the committees. The other committee is agriculture and water, because I know that's very important. Here in Santa Fe, state of New Mexico, and in northern New Mexico, where I grew up in District 46, uh, it's very agricultural there. Uh, we depend on the water rights, and I, I can already see the shift of them trying to take those water rights away and move them to a lot more of the urban areas. And so what I'm going to pass out here is something that Michael has worked on, Michael Ani, and I want you, this is going to be one of the memorials that, I'll go through the first two while those get passed around first. So one of the first memorials I'm going to be working on is, a, it's a joint memorial, it's going to go out to the DOE, NNSA, our governor, and our congressional delegation. And what it is is that up in Los Alamos at Area G, They've been harvesting the legacy waste up there for quite some time now. And they have a certain budget for it. This budget has been, it hasn't really increased. It's gone up slightly. But then when the stimulus money came in, they were able to, it was $290 million, they were able to accelerate that cleanup. And it was able to provide a couple hundred jobs to people there in northern New Mexico. But now that stimulus money has dried up. And so basically this is just a request to DOE and NSA that the people of New Mexico recognize that we want to get that waste out of there as quickly as possible. So it's asking for a big uptick in funding to get rid of legacy waste. Now, the current, they're, currently, the waste that they generate up there, they currently get rid of on a regular basis. But this is strictly to, I think if we can get this, if we can get some federal dollars in, uh, I think we shaved, they shaved off, not we, but Los Alamos shaved off about eight years uh, during that two-year time period. So if we can get some something of a like, can shave off about, about another eight years. And so that's one of the memorials I'm going to be introducing. Another one is up at Santa Cruz Dam that's a little further north. Over the course of many decades, there's been a lot of sediment that's come into the dam and the level now, the capacity is a lot less. 
And when they originally designed that dam, they actually put some pillars, concrete pillars up there, and it's designed to go up about an extra 10 feet. And so in the process of looking at rather dredging it to make sure that we can still capture that capacity of water, or actually adding on to the dam, the dredging, the road down there isn't very conducive to it. It would take a lot of money to get it down. And the other option is to let them drain the water and bring in heavy equipment, but it'd take a couple of years to let it dry to bring that in. In both cases, that cost is going to be in excess of $20 million. So this one is actually to extend the height of the dam now is about $4.5 million. So this is going to be another uh, memorial we're going to be looking at to get some federal funds so that we can capture that water. Um, the third one is, uh, as I mentioned, Michael has spent a lot of time uh, working and, and traveling up towards northern New Mexico uh, looking at the dams. And yesterday, I was actually at the Asequia Commission meeting here for the state of New Mexico. And the state engineer was there, and it was very alarming, this one graph. I only have one page here that they, that they printed out. And so basically, it showed a measuring cup here that indicates each dam. And they showed the, the measuring cup and the size. The size is indicative of the size of the dam. And then they showed the water level in there. And so I'm going to pass this around. And this is really, really alarming because it shows what our holding capacity is right now. And so the memorial that, that Michael has assisted me, or he's actually the one that's drafted up the language. I'm going to take a look at it, and we're going to um, see whatever. And, and you can see it even says there for input from anyone else here. Uh, what this memorial is going to do is, you know, we had the fires up here in the San Cristo Mountains. We had them up in Los Alamos. And we never were proactive in going in and putting these um, sediment traps because we know that we're going to get a lot of ash and all this when, when it does when the fire does happen. Well, up in the northern part, these forests are ripe for fire as well. They're going to happen. And so what this is, is rather than being reactionary, we want to take proactive measures. And so we're going to go out to the Bureau of Reclamation. We're going to go out to um, our congressional delegation in our state and ask. So a lot of this water, the San Juan Chama diversion that feeds a lot of the north central Rio Grande Valley, including Santa Fe and Albuquerque, initiates in southern Colorado on the other side of the Continental Divide. And so there's huge tunnels. There's a huge tunnel that pumps that water through the Continental Divide. So this memorial is, is we're actually going to try and put it in as an emergency, asking for funding so that we can get uh, these sediment traps built where the washdown comes so that we're being proactive and putting best management practices in rather than, they've, they've already come out, so there's going to be a 20%, possibly a 20% reduction in water from that from that diversion. And now if we don't do this, we're going to get a lot of contaminate, contaminants in there. We're going to even have less water. So that's another one of the memorials that I'll be working on as well. And I want to thank Michael for, for his time that he's invested in this. The, the other thing that I'll be co-sponsoring with Senator Peter Wirth is the Green Building Tax Credit. And it's a tax credit that goes out if you build a certain efficiency rating. It's already been in place, I think, for Five years? 2007. Yeah, 2007. It's just sunsetting, and it's $10 million, uh, $5 million for residential, $5 million for commercial. It's just to encourage people to build much more energy efficient. We know energy is going to be a huge issue coming up with so many people now in the world, 7 billion people. I mean, you start to think about this. We were took tens and tens of thousands of years to get to 1940, where we had 2 billion people. And then from 1940... To 2010, we're at seven billion, three and a half times. We're on exponential growth now, and 300 million here in the in the in the country, over 300 million. So we got to get smarter on the way we generate energy and we, the way we use it. And so uh, that's one of the one of the bills I'll be sponsoring with uh, Senator Peter Worth. The other one, which is very which is interesting, the League of Women Voters is after um, they want to see some bills come in on redistricting. We just, as Senator just alluded to, he just went through that process. Currently, the state legislature is the one that uh, determines the redistricting. There always seems to be a big fight, and it gets vetoed, or at least I think in the last past three decades it's been vetoed. And then who lands up paying for it? It's the taxpayers that land up paying for it, because it goes to court. It has to be litigated, I think, this last session. Uh, in 2010, it was cost us $8 million, I think, was the final estimate of what it cost in litigation. And so this idea, there's about 20-some states that actually have a board 
that does this. They, they try and decouple it from the legislature. And so what they're after, and I'm going to be signing on as a co-sponsor on that as well, is it's hard to create a board that there's no politics in or that it's bipartisan. And I mean, it's just, so you can imagine how difficult that is. So the chances are it's probably going to be all of that, all of the above. But the idea is how can we take the component out so it doesn't cost the taxpayers money? And so the idea is that this board uh, that's created, and, and it'll be specified in the draft, there's going to be citizens on it, some judges on it, will come up with three maps. And from these three maps, they'll go to the legislate. They'll go to the legislature. They'll have the option of choosing one of these three maps. And if they choose it, it's fine. It's done. If they don't do that, then it just goes up to the Supreme Court. If they choose it. There's no further litigation that takes place on it. And the buck stops there, and taxpayers are saved the the extra dollars. And I know. Uh, let's see. The other one. Okay. So. So one of the other ones that, uh, there's going to be some campaign disclosure, and I know Senator has a rather large bill in already. Uh, I have a small one in, and it's just going to be in disclosure. Now with the Citizens United ruling, there's, the races have gone so, so ugly. Tons of money being put in, and it's just basically going to be disclosure on the front of the card, whether it's hand-printed or media. Just allowing people to know that the, neither candidate endorsed this particular message and where... Where, the, where it came from. I know currently it already says where it came from, but just letting people know that neither can, they're not working with either candidate and neither candidate endorsed it because a lot of people don't know whose side they're taking and neither do the candidates. I mean, it's become so deceptive and such a science that it's almost like they can, you, it's coming towards your way like it's credit, but it's actually hurting you more than it's helping you. And it shouldn't even be this way. The whole electoral process, in my mind, shouldn't even be this way, this deceptive nature that has gone to be and the amount of money that's spent on it. I mean, we could spend money a lot more wisely, in my opinion, in this country. Uh, the other one, so another one that I'm going to be working with is actually with the state land office. And so it's going to be to help to try and spur some, some jobs in the area. And so currently, up, up in Los Alamos, they have a tech transfer program there where they've been spinning off jobs for a long period, for, for many decades already. But the, we never seem to foster that environment to keep one of these companies here. And these are, I mean, these are small local businesses. They're not huge corporations. These are businesses that are going to be able to employ 10, 15, 20 people with good paying jobs. And the way we're going to get this done is currently at the state land office, that we have one, one thing here in the state of New Mexico which is pretty unique is we have a lot of open lands, a lot of state lands. And so our tax base on property taxes is rather small, so we derive very little monies from property tax for our state budget. So in, in this, this will allow the, the state land office to use some of their, their land and the investment council to give some monies to a particular entrepreneur that's, that's willing to start an industry. And with the lab there right now, there is some, they have $100,000 stipends for entrepreneurship all the way up to $2 million right now. So the, the first thought that came to my mind right away is it, it, yesterday at the ASECIA meeting was interesting because it sounds like the federal government is going to start pulling dollars back um, from doing any type of clearing of the forestry. And so what this is just a wild thought. Of, this is very preliminary, but a thought of my own is that currently we go and we clean, we we burn the forest to clear it out. And to me, that's energy. I mean, if we could harvest that energy, start a small entrepreneurship here. I've got I to gotta work the numbers still. You find somebody that's willing to start one. Hello? 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 We cut your mic. Hello? Is that working? No. No. Is it possible to um, have a corporation so that we hire local people, we, we go in and we clear out responsibly all the underbrush, everything that's created these big hazards and take them back to a facility like this and maybe you make wood pellets out of it so that now we can take that, use that energy constructively into heating homes. Uh, you know, another one is we're going to get to a point of renewable energy. And so this is another thing. I come from a science background. 
I spent 27 years working and I'm still working in the material science and engineering and this is understanding the fundamental properties of materials and how we can make, put them in models, so how we can make metals and alloys and these types of things better for everyday uh, humanity. And so this goes all the way to, to car uh, manufacturers, how can we make materials lighter so that we can get better fuel efficiency in cars. It goes down to the airline, like the new Boeing Dreamliner that's now a lot of carbon composite where we've gotten away from TIE 6 four shells so that we lower the weight on them. So now we can, you know, they can put another additional 120 passengers on that plane for the same fuel efficiency, uh, all the way to renewable type energy applications. These are the things that I work on. And so what I'm imagining right now is, and I, I was speaking to some of the other scientists up there, as far as, you know, we talk about renewable energy, solar and wind, and still one of the major problems with that is that with solar and wind, you, as you harvest it, you can harvest it down to costs very similar to, to using natural gas or coal. And natural gas and coal is just instantaneous, so you, when you want that power fired up, you can, you can use it. But wind and solar, you're only getting it when you're generating it, so the issue comes is storage. So you can you can put you can put renewables on the grid to a certain to a certain point because you got to make sure you match the supply and demand needs. But the other idea is, can we come up instead of battery technology? We've been working on batteries for a long time, even for the automobile industry. And can we change the mindset so that we go to electrical energy storage? And so you know some of the ideas. I think the U.S. has done a very um, hasn't done a good job in investing in our energy science. Sciences. I was just reading a report because I see a lot of BES money, basic energy science money coming through Los Alamos National Laboratory. Our federal government spends about $750 million on the research on this. By comparison, China spends $52 billion on the research. And so I believe, at least it's my belief, that in order for America to continue to prosper and be smarter on the way they generate electricity, we need to make that investment. And a lot of it comes through technology advances. And so, you know, so this goes back to this idea if we can start some of these small entrepreneurial ships from some of these spin-off technologies, and one of them would be electrical energy storage. And is it possible to create, uh, you generate the electricity at two in the morning on a big wind farm when there's no demand, and you can convert it into a chemical like maybe ammonia, so now it's a stable chemical and when you need to release that energy, you could release it at that time. The other one is something that could be done right now that's, um, <clears throat> that doesn't take all that. You've got a big wind farm somewhere, you're generating electricity, it's, there's no demand for it right at the time. You now pump that water up into a big tank and, and that water is now stored energy up in that tank. So when you want to reuse, when you want to generate energy, you just allow it to come back down and, and back into a, another tank. So it's not like you're wasting water. You're just transporting it from one place to another. And so these are some of the, some of the ways that we can start to, to store energy a little bit, a lot, you know, be able to be able to put more on the grid. And so these are some of the ideas that I'm going to be looking at, at initiating um, and figuring out that framework, making that framework so that we can keep some of those small local businesses, high-tech businesses here that are going to advance uh, humanity and advance, you know, between Sandia and Los Alamos, there's $2 billion spent at each laboratory on very smart people and very sophisticated processes and for whatever, we need to just harness that, those, that technology and put it to use uh, here, here in the United States is my belief. And I think New Mexico is ripe for it. I think we have the proper climate here with the sun and the solar, and uh, I mean with the solar and the wind. So these are some of the projects I'm going to be working on. Um, Carl, let's have Peter introduce Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Hey.